dudes that had taught me stuff left before Grenada happened in October. I got okay. back in March of 83. And dude, I hit the ground running. We were in Egypt. We were in Panama. We were in Sudan. I was in schools, water survival school. Uh, I get back from water survival school. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. But John and, and those guys had left. Now it's just me, Buddy Knox, Keith Ingram, and John Thorpe as new airmen coming in. We did a lot of training. To, to Keith Ingram's credit, he was like, hey, Sergeant, we need to be doing more land nav. We need to be out in the field uh, working hard, practicing the, our craft a lot more. And so we did. We started getting out in the field and doing those things. Keith was uh, – he was a beast, man. He could he yeah. could comp a rucksack, and he was really, really good on land nav. I was pretty good, uh, but he was really, really good at it. So we got back from Sudan and Egypt, let's see, probably in late August, and then Grenada kicks off uh, in late October. Okay. Uh, so in the interim, I went to water survival school and, and some other training. But when I get back from water survival school, it's a Thursday. And I remember driving back from the airport and I'm listening on the radio about President Reagan and talking about both Lebanon was going on at the time, mm -hmm. uh, the Marines in Lebanon. They hadn't been bombed yet, but that operation had been going on for a year and a half, two years. Uh, and then some mention of this tiny island in the in the south in the southern caribbean called grenada i'd never heard of the place okay. and uh, uh i get back it's thursday night my wife leaves friday morning to go to uh a church retreat with the ladies and mm -hmm. i was like i was all about it because I'd, I'd been gone a year right yeah. and now since i've been back for six months i've been hitting it hard the train you know what it's like in the rangers it's training oh, yeah. deployment after training deployment followed by a little bit of time off and then you you go into uh, uh operation especially after 9-11 with the good I, not good thing at least after 9-11 you could plan your life around those 90-day increments sure right that's right yeah. not necessarily <laughs> the case before that because we had EDRIs, emergency deployment readiness exercises uh and then you had all the training schedules and the EDRIs were no notice um so anyway, back to my wife. So she's at the church retreat. I've got my oldest son and uh, Jordan and my uh, youngest son at the time, Jeff. He's having a good time. Saturday morning, little pager goes off. We had these little rectangular pagers. <laughs> they, they did nothing but uh, tell you to call this number. And so you would call it into, obviously, I knew the number. You'd call into the Ranger Battalion, and you'd get the CQ. It'd say, report with. A, B, and C bag or whatever the bags were. I don't remember the nomenclature, how we used, what the the names were. But when he named off everything to bring, I was like, this is a first. We never brought all these kit, all this stuff in. So I, right. I get in and uh, first, I've got the boys. So I'm sitting like, what am I going to do with the kids? Yeah. <laughs> and so I... Uh, I called a friend of ours that was in the church and, and his wife was with my wife. I go, oh, okay. Hey, Hey dude, I got to drop the boys off with you. And I can't talk about it. I get to his house and go, here's the boys. Here's the diaper bags. I <laughs> Roxanne and your wife get back tomorrow. I don't know when I'm going to be back. Uh, I left a note for Roxanne and I take off, you know, what a way to leave your yeah. kids. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, so I take off, uh, I report into the battalion area. And I start going, man, there's a lot of stuff going on I'd never seen happen. Injuries were, and emergency deployment readiness exercises were like an ORI, right? Yeah. They test your ability, your readiness. But when you go into an injury, it's almost, or an ORI, it's almost kind of canned. You know you got to get yep. your UTCs out the door in a certain amount of time. It's a very measured approach, systematic checklist approach to getting out the door and then go execute and do the mm -hmm. mission you're trained to do. Uh, this was not that. <laughs> People were running around. Uh, I don't. Are you familiar with the Filthy 13 from World War II, 101st Airborne Division? No, not really. Dude, you need to read about the Filthy 13. Okay. There's a picture of Eisenhower in World War II uh, with a bunch of guys with mohawks. You probably okay. can, that picture probably pops up in your head right now, where he's yeah, on the yeah. flight line pre-invasion, 
Oh yeah, talking. yeah, I have seen that. He's out yep. there talking to the man. The guys are wearing war paint and a mohawk. Yeah. Well, the dude that's in charge of that is an E6. Uh, I can't remember his name now. But anyway, you need to get it. It's called The Filthy 13 and read that okay. book. It's really interesting. And I started digging in this guy some more afterwards, and it's all legit. Uh, but that's the picture that got posted. And it made it look like all the airborne troops were doing that. It was just this small group of Filthy 13, and their job was to jump in and go secure bridges. So they had the toughest mission on D-Day for that sector was to go secure the, this bridge. Right. Um, so I get to the battalion area and lining up to get ammo and there's dudes showing up with Mohawks like that. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on? And then someone says, well, we're going to Grenada. I was like, Grenada, what? And then I remembered the news story. Uh, I'm like, okay. And then we drew weapons and we drew live, drew, uh, drew live ammo and we headed to the range. Well, I had never done that in an injury or pre-deployment, yeah. draw, draw live ammo and go zero your weapon. Huh. What? <laughs> this is for real. Yeah. And, and so now it's starting to sink in and Keith is with me and Thorpe is with me and uh, the officers are off doing their planning stuff and I'm making sure that their kit, you know, radios and all that stuff's right. Uh, we go to the range, we zero, we get ready to go. Uh, we launch... It was rainy and cold in, at, at McCord, Fort Lewis, and we launched uh, to go to Hunter Army Airfield to stage with 1st Battalion. And mm -hmm. I think we launched like at 7, 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, cold, wet. We end up in, in Georgia at Hunter Army Airfield where second or 1st Battalion is staging and prepping and planning, and that's where they're stationed. Uh -huh. and, and we get in there, and before we left, I had to go over to the debt, the detachment, and pick up some radio batteries for our, the Prick 66, no PRC 66, UHF yeah. radio. The Army couldn't supply us with those. We had to have those because those were batteries oh, yeah, that unique had, to that radio. I forgot. That's right. Dude, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, that thing was about this wide, and it was just loaded with AA batteries. Right. Hundreds well, we busted one open one time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, when you yeah. Needed, and it, if you didn't kill those things all the way through battery-wise, you could break those open and take the AA home for your remotes. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and i did that a few times and uh break those open but i had to go over and so i picked up the phone while i'm there i left a note for the detachment commander uh so let's go there i, I left the, for the lieutenant colonel uh and the captain knew i was going uh Grote House. he goes leave a note because we couldn't call we couldn't you know opsec uh, oh, yeah. any of that stuff so i left a note for lieutenant hey sir we're deploying uh can't go into detail We'll make contact when we can, some kind of crap like that. Uh, and I called Roxanne, and she was back by now. And she goes, I panicked. There was a note on the table. What's going on? Are you going to Georgia still? And I went, how does she know I'm going to Georgia? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to violate ComSec right now. I don't know who's listening. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and I said, uh, and then it dawned on me. We were supposed to leave on a cast trip on Tuesday. Oh. To go to Hunter and train with the fist, the two fist teams from the first and second battalion. And went, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we're going. And I just stopped. And I go, hey, I'll call you when I can. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's how I deployed. Uh, wow. And so we, we jump in, we're doing everything. And, and some friends of ours at, back home call in and, and say, hey, uh, we think we know where Jeff's at. You, you need to turn on CNN. And so. She turns on CNN and she goes, oh, my God. <laughs> and, that, and so we had parachuted in. Uh, and so now let's go into the, into the combat po portion of it and uh, some of the things I learned and, and experienced there. So we, we jump in at 500 feet. Our battalion commander, Colonel Ralph Hagler, still alive, still kicking hard. In fact, nice. I'm going back to Grenada with him on the 24th of October. We're going to be there for the 40th anniversary. He's the guest speaker uh, oh, and then cool. coming back. So I'm getting to go back and do that uh, uh, with him, which is pretty he, – he, I modeled my leadership style after him, seeing how he led, uh, very out front, uh, somewhat direct, but you always knew – he would always kind of grin at you when he chewed your ass, like, pull that hat down over your eyes, Ranger. You know, if you had the bill sitting up too high. Oh, yeah. But then, but then he – 
Ranch lead the way, Sergeant. And he just motivates <laughs> the shit out of you. Yeah. Love the guy. Still love the guy. Uh, talk to him all the time. Uh, so so we, we he makes a decision. We're not going to take reserves. We had more stuff we needed to take and just didn't have room. And we were supposed yeah. to airland. First battalion oh, was supposed okay. to clear the airfield. Second battalion was supposed to airland, roll off. And our mission, mission was to roll off, go to Calvigny Barracks on the other side of the island. Hopefully the Cuban force was still there and ask them to stay out of this. We're just here to get our American students off the island. That's all we're interested in and secure the airfield. Stay there. Uh, and, and I thought, okay, what if they decide they don't want to stay there? What's the ROE? And I remember asking this question, well, what, when do we start shooting or not? <laughs> you only fire unless fired upon. How many times have you heard that, JD? Yeah, almost every time. Yeah, exactly. Dude, dude, I just, it, it sucks to, to have to live under those ROEs. And I'm like, what a conundrum is a, as right. a 23 year old sergeant going, what is, what are we doing here? But in the, I need to go back to the planning stage a little bit. I'm sorry. Let's, let's go back to the planning stage at, at uh, Hunter Army Airfield. So we're planning and we're going through what we think we're going to encounter, all the different planning cycles. And I leave the planning because the officers, the orders are now starting to get published. The, the, this, the, the operation is set pretty much of what we're going to do. And uh, I, I leave to go back to the men because I find out in that last meeting there's only two of us jumping in, it's going to be uh -huh. the ALO and me. Well, I go back to my NC or to Ingram and Thorpe Airman. I say, hey, let's get the radios out. Let's make sure everything's uh, ops checked, fresh batteries, good antennas. Uh, put the captain's gear together. Let's make sure all that stuff's done right. And Ingram, he goes, hey, Sergeant Staha you know that the officers are going by themselves. No, they're not. I was just in the session. He goes, no, Larry Beaver and Captain Grothaus are going by themselves. And I go, no, they're not. And I, and I left and I went down the hallway. Captain Beaver had just gotten to us. He hadn't had any updated training. He was right out of jump school. And he's going to go jump in without us. And so I went to Grothaus. I said, hey, sir, I just heard that you and Beaver are jumping in. He goes, yeah. I go, you know, tactical air control party equals one ALO and at least one ROMAD slash ETAC or enlisted terminal attack controller. Beaver's not any of those. So yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he's not even a fully qualified ALO yet. He hadn't been to AGOT, none of that stuff. And I said, so this is me and you at the very least. And he looks at me and he goes, okay. You're going. You're right. And then it set in. Nice. Oh, shit. But then I already kind of knew I was, you know, that I'd yeah. been planning to go. Um, but I went back and I said, okay, guys, here's the news. I'm going with Captain Grothaus as the senior tac P dude. I wish I could take you, but I can't. And I'm on my second tour. So I, Ingram and Thorpe were still fairly new, right? Right, right. So, not that they weren't qualified and trained to go. They certainly were. We just didn't, you know, it's always that trade off, right? What sure. ranger or shooter do you bump to put a JTAC on? Right. We've all been through those discussions over and over and over again. I'd say for yeah. the TAC piece, for the most part, are a little bit more solidified in their attachment to the Rangers or special forces team because yeah. they're actually assigned to that post and are attached to that unit directly. Right. Um, where combat control isn't, and sometimes as a controller, you really got to fight to get your dudes on. Uh, sure. Where TAC P, you're more integrated. You agree with that? I do. Uh huh. One hundred percent. Yeah, that that integration is tighter on the TAC P side because combat control has a mission outside of just the JTAC piece, which isn't always attached to the, an army unit. Um, right. Right. And, and so that's the yeah. Main sometimes part. the Rangers don't see uh, the whole. Not that they don't see the whole big picture, but <clears throat> they have their guys, and they don't want to bump any of their dudes for this unknown dude who just came out of nowhere. Which, no hit on the CCT guy. They're always squared away, and they they have a they have a valid mission set. It's just they we haven't seen them before, so we don't know anything about them. It's just it sometimes it can be tough for sure. That's exactly right. And I remember fighting in the '90s because by that time I was an officer and I was uh, in CCT and trying to get our dudes on a contingency operation. So we were deployed. And a SEAL team or an SF team didn't want to pull a shooter off 
in my argument always to the senior decision makers was, hey, sir, that radio that my controller carries, a lot more powerful than that M4 that that shooter is carrying. They For bring sure. a lot more. And it's not just the, the uh, combat power that they bring from the air. Uh, it's their ability to survey a drop zone, a runway, uh, right. resupply, HLZ, all that. They bring a capability yep. beyond what that that one rifleman brings to the fight. Right, for sure. So as we're uh, finishing up our planning, and I broke the news to Ingram, I think we had him on an airland package, but I don't remember if he ever came to the island or not. I don't think he no, did. He, I, I, I talked to him... Uh about this um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago. And he said that he stayed back at Hunter and was working communications between the home base at Hunter and you guys in, uh, in Grenada. Yep. Uh, he, he did a good job there. Uh, Thorpe was still pretty darn new at the time, but Ingram was, was switched on. Thorpe was too, but Ingram was, was the, the, the guy that we uh, leaned on back, back there. And we need a kit to come forward, right? Like mm -hmm. batteries. Yeah. <laughs> For the right. PRC sixty six <laughs> things like that, yeah. so the, one of the most so one of the most interesting moments was, is we were leaving planning. All the staff had left. It was dark. Everybody had left to go to the C one thirties. We're leaving this what is basically a base ops in the middle of Hunter Army Airfield. You remember those? They kind of looked like big mounds of, but underneath was base ops. Uh, yeah. there at Hunter Army Airfield. And we're coming down this, or out of the bunker, up the hill, up to the taxiway or ramp and taxiway to the airplanes. And uh, Colonel Hagler pulls Grothaus and I aside and all the Rangers move past and they're moving past, they're going to the airplanes. And he looks me square in the eye and he says, you guys, the air power that you guys are going to bring is going to be the determination of how many body bag, how many hua's we bring home in body bags. And I was like, "Holy shit!" No that doubt. 05 is looking at me, a 23 year sergeant, and telling me in Grothouse that our execution determines how many body bags of hua's we bring back in body bags or not, uh, and that air was that essential. He didn't say that in front of any of the men, which I found interesting. Uh, yeah. But he still remembers that conversation that he had with me and Grothaus walking that airplane. Now I'm going to the airplane, walking with my kit, like, oh my god, I just, I, you know, it, it, it's it's you a were shock. already it, you, it, you were already thinking about like just going to combat. Now he put, now you have all this extra responsibility that he that you probably didn't realize at the time, and he just kind of illustrated to you perfectly before you got yep. on the plane. Oh my god. Yep. <laughs> and, dude, that came into play, too, when we got into a, a fight at the end of the runway, which I, I'll go into a little bit at the end because it's a leadership thing that I learned from him, uh, from uh, the, the battalion commander. Uh, but but I we jump in at 500 feet. We don't have reserves. It was one of the oddest things to be approaching that runway. Uh, we're at low level, 500 feet, no reserve. And I'm thinking, what am I going to do with my hands? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, I never and, thought about that. Yeah. He's like, what am I going to do with my hands? It's weird. The the yeah. thing that you think of in a circumstance like that, because even in World War II, they jumped reserves. Yeah. And 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 now I've got this crazy battalion commander that says we're jumping in slick or with no reserve. I'm like, this is nuts. But <laughs> but we've we've got three gun jeeps on the C-130, M-151 jeeps with a trailer loaded down with kit. Uh, ammo, different things. You get 90 millimeter recordless rifles, which come into play here in a little bit. And uh, the, the, the four, uh, is it four words, but the, the phrase you never want to hear, and you know this as a, as a parachutist, as a paratrooper, hot DZ ahead. Oh. Dude, that sent shivers through me. Hot DZ ahead. You got to be kidding me. I it's just oh. like, because the first battalion was already over the airfield and they were taking uh -huh. uh, rounds. In fact, they were a little bit higher and uh, there were uh, ZSU-23-4 anti-aircraft guns. Fortunate Jeez. for us, the Cubans misplaced those. What I mean by misplaced them, they put them in the wrong place. They put them uh -huh. on a ridge line overlooking the airfield. Oh, okay. And the ridge line elevation was about 700 feet, 650, 700 feet. So the first couple of aircrafts took some rounds uh, and word went back. Those birds went around. 
Everybody else continued to follow in, dropped altitude to 500 feet. The first battalion guys did. We were coming in at 500 anyway. Uh, and the AC-130s started taking out those uh, guns that were up on the ridge line. But the reason they weren't effective is the guns couldn't elevate below horizon. They couldn't. Oh, they couldn't. They couldn't dip down enough. Depressed, to but shoot. yeah, yeah. They could only be. They could only go level to the ground. They couldn't. It, everything was from that's up. They couldn't depress to come down. Uh, and if they had had that ability, or if they'd put those guns on the airfield, it would have been a disaster. We would oh, not yeah. have been able to jump in there with those. They, they, pre-assault fires weren't as big then as they are now. Right? We don't yeah. do anything without. Uh, pre-assault fires. I just finished a book and I never heard the term uh, about World War II. And it was the concept that the U.S. Army operated on during World War II was send a bullet, not a man. Sure. Dude, I I never heard that concept. I haven't either, but that's perfect. Yeah. yeah, Because we just didn't have enough manpower between the industrial complex at home needing manpower to build the weapons and the soldiers to execute, we couldn't raise more than 90 divisions, which means we couldn't afford to take uh, a lot of casualties. So we overwhelmed them with fire and maneuver, pre-assault fires, air power, artillery, tanks, uh, infantry. So it's the whole deal. Uh, But we didn't do pre-assault fires in Grenada, right? And we had guys on the ground, uh, JSOC boys were on the ground, uh, but no pre-assault fires to take out those those guns or they hadn't spotted them yet, one of the two. Uh, okay. But as soon as they started lighting us up, the gunships started taking out the the uh, the, the guns up on the ridge line. Uh, nice. One survived, and uh, without because they just took off. The soldiers that were manning it took off, and that mm-hmm. gun is still at Second Battalion headquarters. Oh no, kidding! Yeah, that ZSU twenty three four is still on display there. That's um, awesome. So now we're over the airfield, parachute out more time on my hands than I thought. I thought things would go fast, uh, <laughs> but it felt like we were up there a long time, dude, hanging yeah. suspended under that harness. It was daylight oh, yeah. now. We were supposed to have come oh. in at dark. There were oh, thunderstorms over the airfield. Uh, and so they had to wait till it cleared before we could jump in. So we, and it wasn't just that there was other issues that popped up clearance. Are we going to execute this and that? I'm not aware of all those goings on. I was just at the back of the airplane as a 23 year old nug uh, <laughs> NCO. And uh, we get over the airfield, jump out. I land in a right on the side of the runway, about midway down, right across from the terminal, the air terminal. And there's a hill just to the left up there. And I'm taking a little bit of fire from it, but it wasn't effective fire. But I landed, we had high winds, it's probably 15, 16 knot winds because there was effects from those rain squalls still going on. Yeah. And we jumped exposed rifles and uh, I landed uh, ironically in a huge muddle uh, on the side of the runway of mud and water. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> and I realized right away, cause I looked down and my rifle was stuck in the mud. Oh, and I'm like, oh <laughs> shit. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get, and then I, and I did something I'd never done. And you know, they say, Train like you fight, fight like you train, right? Yeah. And uh, I had put my PRC-66 antenna, mounted it on the radio, to, and I said, well, I'm going to need it in action fast, so I'm going to put it all together and be ready to go when I hit the ground. Yeah. Well, the impact of the ground broke the antenna, the blade. Oh, no. And I didn't have an extra antenna with me, but I'm sitting there, so I'm in mud. First thing I do, priority of, of actions, right, on actions on the objective that you've got to go through and actions on the objective for me on landing, clear the rifle, get that in action first, right? That's the first order of business. So I ironically in the middle of a fight, I'm reaching down into a rucksack, pull out a weapons cleaning kit to run a, a a rod through it and a, and a swab real quick, try to get that thing clear and get it in action as fast as I can. Never fired it, but didn't you? You don't know if you're going to need it or not. Oh, for sure. Well, I clear it, get it in action. Uh, then I start dealing with getting the radio up, and I'm on one knee trying to get the radio up, and I look, the antenna broke. Oh, no. And I told you about Korea and some of the lessons of learning about antennas. And yeah. I learned some field speed and antenna techniques that you're like, yeah, we'll never use this, but I did it anyway. 
And so I, you know, back then, and I don't know about you, but I always had a pen and I had a hundred mile an hour tape, high speed tape. Oh, yeah. I always carried a pen with about an inch or so of high speed tape. Uh, always had extra 550 cord. Uh, and I had a pen or pencil. I think it was a pencil. And I go, okay. They said, splice these two together in training. Let's put it together. Let's see if it works, man. I put that, that pencil alongside the blade antenna, taped it as strong as I could, screwed it on top of the radio, and it worked. Nice. So that whole training stuff that you hear about, train like you fight, fight like you train, uh, it all came into play. And your mind just moving. And it's like all these experiences that, of training that you've done are coming into play. Not all of them, but some of them. That, sure. oh, that's why we do this stuff. That's <laughs> why we did that. And, and you start learning from the, or, or the things you've learned are coming into play uh, in your first combat action. Uh, yeah. and, and so I get all this stuff squared away, get the radio up. I've got the gunship overhead. They're ta- and I'm not controlling them. I'm just making sure I'm online, but I'm listening to the radio talk and they're taking out the rest of the guns, any threats that were around us. Rob Scott was uh, a first battalion, JTAC, Lance Heaton. You know, we were called ETACs back then, uh, yep. enlisted terminal attack controllers. There was only about six or eight of us at the time. You know, okay. Doug Tillman, me, Lance, Rob Scott. There was only a few of us that were qualified because it was relatively new for the Air Force to trust enlisted dudes to be able to do <laughs> right. terminal control. All right, and, right. I mean, the Air Force has air traffic controllers for all those years controlling airplanes, landing and taking off. I think an enlisted dude can, can, can control an airplane to drop a bomb with the right training. And so sure. we were kind of a test bed, if you will, the guys with the Rangers. That's who, who was doing And guys with the 82nd, those were the other ones uh, that were testing the ETAC concept, which ultimately okay. became the JTAC concept. But anyway, I'm up on the radio monitoring what's going on. And we had this super hyper hilarious major who was the op the the s3 and yeah. so he in in the battalion talk had set up on a hill on the other on the side of the runway away from where the enemy was and i'm up on this and they're up there and i'm just trying to get my rifle in action get air situation right that's our primary objective as a controller jtac is to have air air awareness of what assets are overhead, who's talking and all that stuff. So I get up, I'm working and lo and behold, the, the S3 comes running down. I don't remember the name. He was funny as hell. He take ultimate a few years later when I was in Panama stationed in Panama, he was the battalion commander of the Rakasans down there, the airborne battalion oh, no down kidding. there. Yeah. So cross paths with him, but he comes running down. Hilarious dude, man. I'm telling you, we were on a patrol one night. And second ranges at that time, when we hit the ground, we didn't wear helmets. We went soft cap right away, even in combat. Okay. We went soft cap when we got on the ground. Not initially, oh. but oh, before long. If you see any pictures of Grenada and it's dudes wearing helmets, if it's still pots, it's 1st Battalion. And if it's the K-Pot, it's the 82nd dudes. If oh, you okay. see soft cap, it's second rangers wearing soft caps. Oh, That's okay. just, that was our thing. <laughs> And so when you hit the ground, you did a jump, you immediately took your helmet. Well, first thing of priority is taking a piss. Uh, right. you, you know, <laughs> second thing is to strap your, your helmet on the back of your rucksack. And I think we're in Panama and uh, he was taking a knee and he le- leaned forward and that oh. helmet popped him in the back of the head. And he just starts cussing and ranting and uh, everybody's rolling. It was just funny. And so he now is the dude that's above me looking down on me and I'm trying to get all these issues sorted out that I have between the rifle being clogged with mud and the radio antenna breaking because we never jumped with antennas exposed. We just never did or mounted. Yeah. You did this shit when you got on the ground for right, obvious right. reasons, but yeah. that didn't cross my mind that uh, <laughs> that could possibly happen. But now just he's trying to be getting, proactive. Yeah. You just, yeah. You yeah. Oh, I got a great <laughs> idea. Let's mount the antenna. You've never done it before and put it on your radio and let's jump it that way. Bad idea. <laughs> Uh, right. But anyway, now that major is standing over the top of me. Great, dude. And he goes, Sergeant Staha, you need to get up on the hill right now. Where's your ALO? Sir, I don't know. I'm clearing my rifle, getting the radio. I'm t- trying to get airplanes up. Get up on the hill. You're, you're going to be running in the air. And I get up there, and there's a combat controller up there, Ray Heath, who many years later uh, uh, was the DO of the 21st STS when I was there as a 
flight commander. And then he oh, fleeted okay. up as a, as the uh, squadron commander replacing General Longoria. We'll get into oh, okay. that story later if you want to do that too. Sure. Uh, and uh, he was a, a E-5 at the time, and he was up on the hill. So he had air awareness I didn't quite have yet. I was still trying to get situated. And I get up on the hill, and uh, we, we start working through the issues. And a uh, few, few firefights here and there going on. Um, but the main thing is the lessons you learn from those environments, right? The, the lessons yeah. learned in combat. Grenade was an exciting uh, high per diem, low intensity conflict operation that are the best kind to go be a part of instead of these yeah. multi year wars. Uh, right, right. <laughs> yeah. So as we advance through the day, finally the ALO links up. When he links up with me, he hands me his broken PRC 66. He goes, You need to get this working. I went, like, Hey, sir, this is my radio. He goes, No, you need to get this one working. I went, well, How am I going to get it working? I'm a, I'm a romad, but I'm not, I'm not a radio tech, uh, right. but the PRC 66, I, I had had that radio on a couple of, uh, cast trips and it would crap out on me about an, every, an hour into ops up on in, in the Gila band, no matter where we were on a cast trip, that radio would break. And I remember taking radio maintenance two or three times. It says, you guys got to fix this thing. It didn't work. And I go, you turn it off. It'll work fine for 30 or 40 minutes. And then it craps out on you. Typical, mediocre, middle-of-the-road radio tech opens it up, tests it, comes back. There's nothing wrong with this radio, Sergeant Staha. Okay, go to the next training iteration. Same thing happens. Take it back. There's nothing wrong with this radio, Sergeant Staha. So in Grenada, this thing craps out on the ALO. I uh, finally have some time. I use my uh, multi-tool, opened uh, the back plate of the PRC-66, Started resetting the the we had those uh, those plug in voltage regulators. Everything is not like it is today with a computer board. It's plug in tubes yeah, yeah, all yeah. in this radio. So I'm resetting things, thinking maybe I've got a loose connection with something. Lo and behold, I close it back up and it's working. Nice. Then we get into a fight at the end of the runway. A counterattack by BTR 60s at the far end of the runway. Uh, and the radios craps out on me. Actually, it crapped oh, out on man. me before we got into the counterattack. And we're up at the, on a, there's a hill right at the end of the 10,000 foot runway. And just behind the hill is True Blue Compound where the medical students lived and went to school. That's where the university is. Still there. Not the, okay. they've, they've updated and moved their buildings and campus a little bit, but True Blue was at the end of the runway. And that was our main. Once we realized we weren't going to roll off the airplanes and go to Calvigny for our primary mission, because the Cubans were on the airfield, we didn't have to go find them. Oh, you okay. know, they're right there. We're fighting them. And of course, oh. some of the, the, the people's revolutionary army of Grenadians that were loyal to the coup, the people who attempt, who did uh, do the coup uh, were fighting us as well. They weren't really all that great. Uh, you know, their marksmanship wasn't where it was supposed to be. Uh, but, we're at the end of the, the runway, and we're up on this hill. There's a C-141 that had just came in, offloaded 82nd dudes back at the ramp. It's doing a 180, and it's loading casualties onto this one, 141. It is loud because I'm, I'm probably 150 feet, 200 feet from this thing, and th they're loading casualties. The loadmaster, you know, they're out there with their cord directing people what to do, and uh, – I'm up on this hill. There's five Rangers with me on this gun Jeep. I was usually with the gun Jeep with the battalion commander or near him. And that, that gun Jeep's up on the hill and I'm inside my rucksack. It's noisy as hell. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on in my radio. And all of a sudden I feel like I'm alone. And I uh, look up and I look down the, the hill and the five Rangers had, and they were moving out with a purpose, getting some defilade. And I was like, what's going on? And all of a sudden I realized we're being counterattacked. The BTR 60s are coming up behind that hill or around that hill trying to get up on the runway. So now I don't have a radio that works. And I decided, okay, the Rangers are leaving this hilltop. I'm leaving this hilltop. Yeah. <laughs> so I make the mistake of leaving my rucksack up on the, on, on, in the back of the Jeep. I had my oh, rifle, no. but I left the yeah, radio yeah. up there. And, you know, you're embarrassed by some of this stuff, but at the same time, it's your first time in combat. Sure. And this Sergeant Major Voiles comes running. I'm behind this big boulder. That's my defilade. There's a big boulder 
and there's a Delta operator there. And I'm thinking to myself, and Keith Ingram, when I left, they gave me a plaque. I got it in here somewhere, I think. <laughs> I got it in here somewhere. And it's an infantry soldier, follow me kind of guy with holding the rifle, follow me. And yeah. uh, that, and on that plaque with that follow me, it says, Sergeant Staha, it was great serving with you. Where's the rock? Because I would tell <laughs> the story of that rock. And there's a Delta operator behind that rock. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Sure. And uh, Rangers are starting to get online. The 90s are trying to get online. That's our only anti-armor capability we had, which is a fantastic weapon for that. But the yeah. 90 rounds were not with the guns. They had just came in on an airline, <laughs> airline package, and it was way back at the terminal. So they oh, scrambled man. Jeeps to go get those rounds. So the, getting the gunship overhead was critical, yeah. critical to get air power. And there's other dudes working it, too. There's combat controllers working it. Uh, uh, God, I can't think of his name. But other dudes working, uh, the, Glenn Palmer. Then uh, Tech Sergeant Glenn Palmer, I believe he was with the with a two four, so everybody's trying to get gunships up, and Sergeant Major Voss comes running by, and he goes, Sergeant Staha, where's your radio? That <laughs> kind of uh, up there. <laughs> Don't you think you need that about now? So now I got to run up. You know, it, it wasn't heroic. I was just going up to get my rucksack with the radio so yeah. I could try to get an airplane. Well, that sixty six still isn't working, so I finally get a uh, my FM radio up. And I relayed down to my ALO, who was he was midfield. I was at the far end with the battalion commander and okay. uh, said, hey, man, we need to get gunship overhead. This is what's going on. Here's the targets. They're, they now are not moving. The 90 gunners had got online. They were to my left, probably 100 feet to my left. There was three or four gunners. And uh, the one of the gunners got the lead BTR-60. And the gunships got the two behind it. Oh, so the, one or two behind it. and. Uh, See, seeing that take place and the Rangers and seeing that back blast, there was one moment, you know how things, you've been in combat. I don't know if your first combat, if things slowed down for you. A little bit, uh, yeah. But I had the, that thing you see where everything's moving in slow motion. <laughs> and, and I look to my left, and there's a lot of stuff going on, right? Rounds going off, uh, people returning fire. Uh and the 90 gunners going off and they're yelling for back. They would say 90, which means stay back. The back, this get, get ready. The back blast is getting ready to go off. But then they would say rounds. And there was a dude running back and forth with rounds. Well, this dude runs down the line behind these four guns and they would say 90 and he'd get knocked back about five feet. And he was <laughs> kept his feet, which was friggin' amazing that this dude. That was is able amazing. To yeah. But it's oh adrenaline, dude. It's adrenaline. Yeah. If it had been training, <laughs> it would have knocked him for a loop, and he oh, got the yeah. night. But I, that was just one of those funny moments in combat. You look to your left, and you're laughing because <laughs> of what's taking place. And I got a combat story later where I'm laughing again. Uh, but yeah. this time, things didn't slow down that second combat or that other combat experience uh, in, in Iraq. But the, the 90s go off, and all that stuff goes up. Lo and behold, we take out all the BTR 60s. Uh, we kill all the guys. As the BTR-60 are disabled, the surviving infantrymen, the Cubans that were in those in those uh, uh, vehicles, took shelter behind the vehicles that had been hit. And there okay. were there's about a hundred yards to the jungle, and one at a time they would bolt to try to get to the jungle. And it, Rangers were just sitting up there just waiting, and the dude would open. And 30 rifles go off. It was quite <laughs> unnecessary, the amount of fire. But they're yeah. the infantry. They're, you know, they're fighting another infantry force, and it just counterattacked us. Uh, and we eliminated all of them. Uh, I yeah. shouldn't say we, because I, I, I didn't shoot anybody. Uh, but the force took care of business and uh, eliminated those guys. Uh, sure. At the end of that firefight, that was the first big fight I'd ever been in. And it was the first big fight the battalion had been in on the island up to that point. Uh, and at the end of the fight, needless to say, adrenaline is running high. Everybody's amped up. And Colonel Hagler did something I, you just, I just didn't expect. I, and I didn't even take a coin with me to the island. It just didn't enter my mind. I need to take a coin in case of a coin check. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he pulls out a coin. And he said, because now it's all the headquarters guys around him. He goes, man, that was a great yeah. fight, right? 
coin check. He pulls it out. And I realized what he was doing is decompressing us from a stressful environment and bringing yeah. us calmly back down to earth. He'd been in Vietnam. He'd been in plenty of fights before. And he showed me what leadership under fire is supposed to look like, right? Yeah. He's controlling the fight. He, the Sergeant Major's doing the Sergeant Major's role, running up and down the line, trooping the line. And yeah. the battalion commander's watching it all and managing the fight. And then at the end, hey, how's everybody doing? That was a fun fight, wasn't it? Coin check. <laughs> So we're done doing push-ups on a runway five minutes after being in this this environment where you could die, and the battalion commander has you doing push-ups. It's funny as hell. Hey!